Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hi, I'm Bridget. And I am an alcoholic. Hi, Bridget. Bridget. Um, I was asked to speak at this meeting a while ago, and it's funny because it's my belly button birthday today. Happy birthday. Thank you. Um, And it was like when I got asked, I was like, I don't want to speak at an AA meeting on my birthday. (laughs) But then I realized that like this is actually really where I want to and need to be on my birthday. And um, I had a really lovely day with friends, most of whom were sober and that I've met through the program and we just, it was just lovely. I decided I wanted to go to the woods and like be in the woods for hours on end. And that's something I never would have done for myself on a birthday ever. Like I, you know, um, my birthdays are always tricky. You know, I always feel like, Oh, what am I doing? What have I done? How am I living? And I feel like the more sober I get, the easier birthdays feel because I feel like I'm actually making progress in my life for the first time. And that feels really good. Um, I have a little over three years of sobriety under my belt this time. And um, it's been really powerful and hard and great and like all the things, you know. Um, Sobriety is not an easy path, but it is really simple. And um, I've really learned that if I just don't drink today and do the next right thing and try to be of service and pray and meditate, like, things work out in ways that I can't really understand, um, but ways that are much better than I could have planned myself. Um, and I guess I just want to like say that right now my life is really very challenging. Like my spouse and I are going to end up pretty soon being, um, living on separate coasts. Um, and this is brand new news for me. It's really been, it's like been a week and a half that I've known that this was going to happen and it's really stressful and really sad and hard and scary and all the things. And I'm so grateful that I'm not drunk. Like just if I were drunk right now, it would be, we would be done, you know, like there wouldn't be any room for working it out or for like figuring out how to do this thing together. Um, But, like, I've gained, what I've gained through sobriety is, like, the ability to face really tricky situations with grace. And, um, and believe me, I cry, I scream, I get mad, but I also, like, know how to heal and, like, know how to reach out to people to get support. And that's something I did not know how to do while I was drinking. Um, I, relapse is a part of my story, and I, I feel like I learned a lot in that relapse. I learned, like, how what I'm able to now see like what I did while I was the sober the first time that led me to my relapse. And so I'm able to now see like, Oh, don't do those things. Like if I don't want to go to meetings, I go to meetings. You know, if I want to break up with my sponsor, I don't break up with my sponsor. If I want to let go of my sponsees, I go and I meet with them. Um, it's like the opposite, doing the opposite of what, what I want to do, um, keeps me sober. And what's cool is that the more I do that, the the opposite things become the things that I actually want to do and that, that actually feel right and that feel um, like, you know, it's not, it's not even a wanting to do. It's just like, I know that that's the next right thing, you know, and that feels good. Um, and, um, you know, I, I, and I also just try to keep remembering how bad it got and how dark I felt and how alone I felt and how much I had to lie to every single person in my life. I mean, I got drunk for about three months. I was getting drunk every day and like my spouse didn't know about it, which was like a miracle. I don't know how they didn't know. It was like they were not paying attention or something, but I was just like, I was determined to like get away with being drunk. Cause that's all, that was like my high, my highest priority in my life was to just be <clears throat> not feeling all the shit that I was going through. And, um, you know, and then I got caught and it was horrible. It was shameful and, and, and sad. And I was frustrated with myself that first of all, I didn't get away with it. And second of all, that I had to stop, you know, and I didn't know how to stop, but I knew that when I, the first time I had come into AA, I, I was able to stop, you know, and I, and I did it for like two and a half years. And then I started to unravel it. 
on purpose. I had decided I was going to go out about eight months before I went out. And I very much just went through the paces of untying myself from this program. And now what I do is I, I want to be here, you know, I want to tie myself in and I want to be in the herd and, and I try to show up for it as much as I can, even when I really don't want to. And it's making my life a lot better. So, um, you know, that's a, that's a, I don't know. And, and for me, it's like working with my sponsor has become the num like such an important piece of the whole puzzle. You know, we, we meet weekly. She and I are really good friends. Um, I call her a lot. She probably is really sick of me right now. Um, but you know, I'm helping her stay sober too. Like she's going through, through some crazy stuff in her life. And like, she, she, I was like, are, are you sure I should be calling you while you're dealing with all this stuff? And she's like, you, yes, please call me. Like I need to stay in service so that I don't drink. And I feel that like, cause I'm right now, I feel like I have one sponsee who's calling me and texting me and I'm like, thank you. Like keep reminding me that like sobriety is much better. It's the much easier, softer option. Um, you know, cause when, when life gets hard, it feels like when life gets really good or really hard, it feels like the best thing to do for me is to drink. And, and it's, and like, that's never, it, it, it always destroys everything when I, when I start getting drunk again, like it's just, I lose my relationships. I lose my, my sanity. I, you know, I lose and I lose and I get more and more isolated and more and more alone. And and more and more confused and hopeless and like unable to see how to step forward. And it just makes sense to stay in the same place and get drunk and, you know, like, and that cycle just starts and continues and, and keeps going. And, um, yeah. Um, I did this incredible fourth step last year that like took me four months to write. Like it was, it was nuts. And it was like, all it was all of it. It was like deep, deep, crazy stuff that the other three, four steps that I had done didn't even touch the surface of. And I read my fifth step to my sponsor and she ended up like having to t take a six hour nap afterwards. Cause it was so intense. And, um, and I feel like something happened in there that like shifted my, my relationship to this program and to the people in the program and to my higher power. Um, and I was able to, for the first time, feel held by <coughs> AA and really held by a higher, a power greater than myself. And just a few months ago, I started meditating every morning for five minutes. And like, it's really made a difference. I was like, I'm not going to meditate. Like y'all are, that's not, that's not for me. Um, or I'd like try it. I do like two or three days. And then I'd like be like, I don't really need to do that. And, but like, five minutes a day of just like listening to my breath and feeling present makes it so when crazy things happen or when I get, when I, when a situation that I would otherwise be super reactive in happens, I can slow down, you know, and I can like under, I can remember what it feels like to check in with myself because I'm getting into that practice. So, um, yeah, I guess I just want to say that like, I never thought that this program would give me what it's given me. Like I never really understood. Like I knew I've known about AA since I was young. My aunt was a, is, is a pretty sick alcoholic and there were many people in my life in and out of the program. And I didn't really understand. I didn't trust it. I didn't tr like, it was a, people who I had really bad relationships with also had relationships with AA. And so I was like, ah, this is like not this thing I want to get into. But I knew I was like, hopeless. Like I knew I couldn't stop drinking. And I finally was like, well, if I can't do this, maybe that thing that a lot of these other people go to would work. And I went and, and I found something here. I found a way to live and a way to deal with life. And, and it's not a easy path and it's not a, a straight path. And some days I don't want to be here, but you know, the more I come, the more I realize it's the, it's the right place for me. And the more I identify with folks in the room and like, listen and hear my story and other people's things, the less I feel alone. And, um, yeah. So I want to just say like, welcome to anybody who's new or feeling new or struggling because I'm struggling and I know I'm not alone in that. <laughs>
And that's really cool. Like, that's kind of amazing that we have this place to be, to not feel alone. Um, Because being human is freaking hard. And it's, especially right now, I just feel like there's so much crazy tension in the air everywhere I go and in my own life and in a lot of people's lives that I know. And to have a place where we can come and find camaraderie and find, like, fellow humans to, like, sit with and hear and understand and be seen by... It's a it's a huge blessing, and so I feel really lucky to be a part of this program, and super lucky lucky to be of service tonight. So thank you. Hi, my name's Dave. I'm an alcoholic. Hi, Dave. Hi. God, I've I've shared at so many meetings, but it's it's weird having a microphone. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, and having so much time. I did this before about five years ago, and it's it's a little bit different doing 40 minutes, but mm-hmm. I decided to just keep it simple and talk about, you know, what it was like, what happened, and what it's like now. And I have a little bit more time to fill in those areas. Um, I'm really happy to be at an AA meeting tonight. This reminds me of my first meeting because it was also on a Saturday night, and uh, that was March 8th, 2003, and uh, that's also my sobriety date, and um, that was in Berkeley, and there was a card table at the front of the room, and I didn't know anything about AA, um, but I saw the card table with a couple of people sitting behind it, and I thought, they must be running this place, and they must be really important, and no, we're not, but... um, (laughs) But uh, when I got to that first meeting, I, I, I was having a lot of problems. I had not lost everything yet, but I was heading in that direction. I had just gotten fired from my job, and uh, that was what finally um, let me ask for help. Uh, my plan was to... Uh, come to AA and try to get my life back together a little bit. I didn't think that I was an alcoholic, and my plan was to keep... uh, I I wasn't planning to stop drinking. I I identified as an addict um, way before I I could uh, understand the the form that alcoholism takes in for me. Um, So I went to this meeting just thinking I'm going to try to clean up my life a little bit, and I'm not going to stick around. I couldn't imagine why anybody would keep going to AA meetings for years and years. I I just thought I'd get in there and do a little damage control and bye. Um, Now I'm really happy to be in AA. It's one of the most important things in my life, and um, my life has changed a lot uh, in 16 and a half years. So... Getting back to the beginning, what it was like, uh, I grew up here in the East Bay. I, uh, you know, my family was, uh, there was alcoholism in my family. I don't know if either one of my parents were alcoholics, but I know that there was a lot of prescription medicines that were being taken to, uh, for, for them to uh, deal with their moods. Um, it was a pretty dysfunctional family all around. Um, you know, uh, not a happy family. And so I grew up with this feeling of um, being anxious and feeling different. And um, I am different. Um, I, I, I'm i gay. And when I was growing up, I that just uh, kind of freaked me out. I didn't understand it for, you know, until I was well into adulthood. But um, I always had this feeling like the future wasn't going to work out for me the way it was supposed to. So I uh, wasn't wasn't really a happy kid. When I got to be around um, 12 years old, uh, that was when in our family it was uh, was time for kids to, uh, it was okay for kids to start drinking a little bit. And so um, you know, we, my dad would let us have wine. And so we, you know, I would drink wine. I have a brother who's a couple years younger than me. He's also one of us and he's in recovery now. Thank, thankfully. Um, 
Actually, I remember the first time that I drank alcohol. I, it was um, a, some beer. My dad let me taste his beer when I was four years old, and I loved it. I thought mm -hmm. it just tasted so great, which is kind of weird because I really yeah. remember that. It was it was Oli, I think, Olympia. Yes. Anybody remember Oli? It had that, yeah. I just thought, wow, it's like kind of like 7-Up, but different. And <laughs> so, but anyway, so... When I got into my teens, uh, you know, around 14, that's when I really started um, drinking and uh, and also smoking pot. Um, and, you know, what it was like was uh, I remember one time I was setting the table and um, my dad was out, but his girlfriend was uh, was there and uh, she had one of, one of her girlfriends and her daughter came over for dinner and they asked me to set the table and so here's a bottle of wine put it on the table I thought well I should probably pour everybody a glass of wine and let me just make it fast I, I drank the whole bottle of wine while I was setting the table in like about three minutes and um, and it was great. I loved that. Um, and, you know, there weren't any consequences either when my dad got home and, uh, you know, Linda told him what had happened. And I mean, I was shit faced and, and uh, obviously and, you know, and and uh, it's like, oh, he's growing up, you know, <laughs> it was like, yeah. So there was like that and, uh, you know, getting drunk at somebody's bar mitzvah when I was like 12 years old and, uh, and uh, you know, how, wow, he's really coming out of his shell. He's so social now, you know. So it was, it seemed like it, it was a good thing. And uh, I really got into it when I was about 14 and I, I remember like, uh swiping a pint of uh, gin and taking it on a Boy Scout camp out and uh, going off by, not sharing it with the guys, but just going off on the side and drinking it all like in three slugs and uh, blacking out and trying to steal food from the supply tent. And um, I do remember that. They kept like trying to chew me away like some kind of a feral animal or something. And, and um and I and I noticed that the kids were smoking pot, and I thought that's for me. I really want to learn how to do that. So I, if only I could, you know, like get into that circle. So that became actually that became my drug of choice. I I was really glad at the beginning when people were introducing themselves here tonight, and so many of you identified as addicts. When I first got here, that's what I thought. I, I thought I was a drug addict, and specifically a, a pot addict. I could not stop smoking pot, and um, I have to include that in my story. I know this is an AA meeting, and um, you know the focus is on alcohol, but uh, I think a lot of us have this uh, you know cross addiction where one thing will take the place of another, depending on what's available. And anyway, so the pot came along, and through high school, I was able to keep it just to, um, you know, the weekends. And, you know, it would drink a couple of uh, six-packs, smoke a bunch of weed with the buddies, go throw up in the bushes. Uh, uh, and it's like, I've got to figure out how to, like, do this better and be, like, more, you know, have less consequences. And that's basically what it was like for, for 25 years was just trying to figure out how to, because I just didn't want to give it up. And it got to the point where I didn't think I could. I thought it was, I, I actually thought it's like being bitten by a vampire. I, I've got the, it's in my blood now. I've become an addict. I just can't live without these substances to make me feel more comfortable or whatever it was doing to me. And I thought, it's too bad, uh, you know, I mean, by the time I was in my 20s, I, I was like, I, it, it's too bad that this happened to me, but now I'm stuck with it, so I better just figure out how to make the best of it. And, and um, that's, I carried that belief with me until, you know, the age of 42 when I came into these rooms. Uh, and it's kind of interesting how that happened, but I, I have a little bit more time to, to, um, give you the drunk -a log I usually don't do the drunk -a log but it's fun to do that if you have time. And <laughs> that's one of the things about a 40, 40 minute share. So I'll just try to hit some of the highlights. I, um, 
I don't know what order to go in. I d drove a truck into a lake. I accidentally <laughs> shot the guns in the house. Uh, and that's plural because it happened more than once. And, you know, and um, I mean, one story that I really that's really colorful is uh, like I I my dad had a second house in Phoenix and I went down to visit him when I was about 25. And this was in 1985. So we didn't have cell phones or anything like that. Personal organizers. I didn't know his Phoenix phone number and I didn't know his address. He picked me up at the airport spent a few days with him, and then he took me back to the airport and dropped me off when it was time to go home. But in my addled mind, I, I had got the day wrong, and I didn't have any way of calling him or getting back to his house because I didn't know his phone number or his address. So I had to fend for myself. So it was like several hours. I finally got a connection to, I was going to Oakland. I got a connection to Long Beach and I flew to Long Beach and I had like an hour to kill there. So what did I do? I went to the bar and drank about six beers and, uh, you know, in about 45 minutes. And then I went over to the parking lot and smoked some pot. And then I got on the plane and the plane took off and about 30 seconds after it took off, I knew I was going to throw up like any second. And so I got up and climbed. I was on the window seat. When I got in the plane, I was just like doing this because I didn't <laughs> want anybody to see what a wreck I was. And I um, plane had just taken off. It's climbing up. You know, there was nobody gets up like a minute after the plane. And I climb over the people sitting on, in the other two seats of the 737. And I'm like running to the bathroom and I know I'm not going to make it and I see the little galley on the side and I'm just like okay this will do and I just spewed right into the galley and um, and I went back to my seat and the uh, stewardess came over and are you okay and I and I thought this was so <coughs> cute I, I said I always get air sick <laughs> and which was not, that's just bullshit. And I, it's like, I'm not proud of that. I mean, I do think it's funny because it's just, just so ridiculous. But I mean, it's just, I, I could tell a lot of other stories like that. I, I don't know. The last time I told my drunk log, somebody after the meeting who knew me came up and said, Dave, you forgot to tell the one about driving the truck into the lake. I think <laughs> I think I got that one. Anyway, it was a total mess. Um and I um I moved back to the uh to the East Coast when I after college and um it's hard to find weed back there and so I would pretty much all I had was alcohol. I should mention when I was in college, I went to Cal, uh, were a lot of drugs. I experimented with a bunch of other things, mostly Coke and pills and, um, nitrous oxide was a favorite. Um, you know, yeah, that's a funny one. And, uh, I'm so sorry. I'm just, it's the, ner it's the nerves of being up here and having 40 minutes to, uh, but, but, um, but I, you know, none of those things really stuck, uh, after college except the nitrous. And so I had like basically the nitrous. <laughs> I love that stuff and the nitrous and the, the alcohol and the, um, <laughs> weed, my favorite. And, but like I lived in Boston for seven years and, uh, up until age 30 and I could, it was hard to find weed. And so I, I, my drinking really, really filled in the blanks there. And I never really thought that I drank that much, you know, like when I'd go to the doctor and they'd ask you to fill out the questionnaire of how much you drank and I'd put like, you know, like four drinks a day, which was kind of a baseline. I, I'd say that was, my, I mean, there were times when it was a lot more, but I thought four drinks a day is nothing. That's not an alcoholic and it, it's not right. <laughs> well, you know, I'm saying that tongue in cheek. Um, and I know it's not as, as much as a lot of us, but you know, for me, it, I mean, one of the things I've learned in recovery is that it's, it's not how much 
or even how often necessarily we drink, but it's what it does when we drink and, you know, how, what it is to us. It's, there's a lot, it takes a lot of different forms, this addiction. But anyway, um, uh, I moved back to California uh, when I was 30, and basically for the next 12 years, things just got worse and worse for me. I, I was sick a lot. I uh, got a lot of, I uh, got bronchitis all the time. Um, and um, I was smoking a lot of weed, spending a lot of money on weed. It had a, you know, I, I, I always had jobs that um, kind of allowed me to fit my, my using into it and did okay. But, you know, there were times when I didn't have very much money and there were times that I did, but it was always impossible for me to pay my bills on time. It didn't matter how much money I had. I can't tell you how many times they turned off the phone or something like that because I just, I couldn't be bothered. You know, I mean, my life was, was really a mess. And, uh, I, I mentioned how I was, got sick a lot, but it was what, how I was feeling mentally that was, that was really, um, just got very irritable and cranky and, and, um, easily set off. I get, would get into road rage, uh, situations, uh, or not just road rage. It could be like standing in line at the store rage or, uh, things like that. And he didn't know that was a thing, right? Or maybe you do, uh, but, but, um, so, yeah, I mean, my state of mind was a mess and, uh, you know, I mean, like relationships were, were not really happening. I should, I mentioned at the beginning that I'm gay and I, I, you know, I didn't, wasn't really comfortable with that for a long time when I it wasn't until I was probably in my mid thirties that it was like, I started to accept it and actually started acting on that. I mean, I had had some girlfriends before that and, and, um, um, but, uh, you know, never anything that was really important to me and, uh, never anything that really lasted. And, um, and I was such a mess. Um, and, uh, 20 minutes. Okay. Get sober. I'm getting sober. Uh, yeah. So what happened? Uh, yeah. I think I was just kind of ha- trying to keep it together and, um, what happened, I, uh, I started dating someone who was in recovery and, um, I, I met this guy, his name was Jeff. Um, and, uh, some of you, uh, knew him. He's Jeff died three years ago. We, we ended up really, um, I wasn't going to tell the story this way, but it, um, it was the first time that either one of us had had that kind of a relationship. We fell in love right away. Um, and, uh, we got married after a little while and, uh, we had a, a great time together. He was in recovery. Um, when he told me that on the second date, uh, I didn't understand what that meant. He said, for, actually first he said, uh, I'm in AA and I thought, or he said, I'm an alcoholic. And I thought, oh shit, I don't need problems like this. And, <laughs> and, then, and then he, but, but he said, um, I, uh, uh, and I've been sober for 16 years. And I was like, and, and I go to AA a lot. And I was like, it doesn't compute. You know, why is he still going to AA after 16 years if he's, you know, it, it didn't make any sense. All I knew is I couldn't tell him what I was doing. Uh, but I also had a theory of dating is that get the weed out on the table early. Cause if they're not okay with that, that's not going to, you know, that's not going to work. So <laughs> I, so I said, I, I smoke pot and he said, Oh yeah, how often? And I said, well, weekly, <laughs> weekly. I uh, see if this was a marijuana anonymous meeting and I go to those two sometimes, 
everybody would laugh because they'd know what that, I mean, yeah, I'd smoke for like weeks on end, basically. And, <laughs> yeah. I, and uh, you know, I was the kind of, um, I would, you know, smoke like, you know, 10 times a day and wake up at four in the morning to smoke some more and go back to sleep and, you know, wake up and see the clocks at six, six o'clock and not know if it was AM or PM and shit like that. Anyway, Oh, yeah, like I need this. Um, okay. So, that's okay. I'm sober. Um, so, yeah, so I figured I've got I've to hide the extent of my problem from Jeff. I, uh, and, and that's what I did. And later he told me if, if alcohol was your drug of choice, I would have sniffed it out in five seconds. But you're a pothead. I didn't, and, and actually at that point, I was not drinking very much because a year earlier, my doctor had suggested that I stop drinking and that should have been a clue, but, <laughs> but, um, and I actually, I, I, I could do that. I could, you know, I mean, yeah, there were times when I still really wanted to have a drink, even though I knew that it was going to be bad for me. I was, I, he told me to stop drinking because I was having, uh, the gastro, uh, you know, GERD. Uh, gastrointestinal reflux disease and alcohol is bad for that and I'm like yeah it's like tearing up my insides but you know one drink it'll I kind of <laughs> so but I had pretty much not was not drinking uh, but I was anyway so fast forward we, we had been together for about three four months and I got fired from my job because I had just you know fucked up too many times and um, I knew that the next thing that was going to happen was the next thing that was going to blow up, that I, the next thing I was going to lose would be Jeff. And I didn't want to do that because we, we really had a, something special. And um, I, it was a Saturday night. He came over to my uh, place. I was living in Emeryville at the time. And... Uh, I told him I've got a substance abuse problem. I didn't know what he was going to do. I thought he might say, you lied to me, you know, you told me, you know, or whatever. But I didn't think he was going to do that. And he didn't. He said, do you want to go to a meeting? And I said, yeah, let's. I had never thought of asking for help before, but I was desperate. Not only that, I thought that it could work for me because I had spent enough time around this guy who had a, a really good program. Some of you have heard him speak in, in the rooms and knew him, and, and um, I learned a lot from him. Anyway, um, we went to a meeting, and that was my the beginning of my recovery. I didn't know what to expect. I didn't know what the steps were. I knew there were 12 steps. And when I saw them on the, the scroll on the, you know, yeah, yeah those, um, I didn't know what they meant. Uh, I, but I started reading through them because I knew that I wanted to do them as fast as possible and get the hell out of there. So I thought, <laughs> okay, the first one, I've done that because I'm here. And the second one, yeah, probably that one too. And then I saw the third one and I thought, God, I didn't know this had anything to do with God. I'm kind of screwed now because I don't believe in God. And, um, well, I was desperate, and so I sat there in that meeting, and one of the guys sitting behind the card table, the speaker at that meeting, uh, actually had a story that was a lot like mine, and he also didn't think that he had a problem with alcohol when he came to the rooms. He was a heroin addict, and uh, and an alcoholic too, but you know, you, didn't, it, you know, I think for a lot of us, the if we have a drug of choice that's other than alcohol, the alcohol just flies under the radar and we don't recognize what, how much of a problem it is or could be and vice versa. And actually in my sobriety, uh, alcohol has been way more tempting to me than marijuana. I never crave marijuana, but I think about drinking sometimes. I dream about it sometimes. I, I miss it. Um, but I don't want it. Anyway, um, at, after the meeting, when they started uh, talking about sponsorship, um, 
Jeff suggested that I approach the speaker and ask him to be my temporary sponsor. So I went and talked to him, and uh, and he became my sponsor. I told him I had a problem with the God thing. He gave me a big book. He bought a big book and gave it to me and um, suggested that I read the chapter to the agnostic and the appendix having to do with spirituality. And, and that I just try to come up with some kind of a higher power. And so I decided that the group would be the higher power that I would start with. And that's changed over the years. I eventually figured out that even though I don't understand God that or higher power, um, I've always believed in some kind of a higher power, nature at least, things outside of my control. I mean, there's many ways of understanding higher powers, and I use a lot of different uh, ones of them. Um, but, I mean, I think that what was really threatening to me when I saw that third step is the idea of turning my will over. I mean, I'm supposed to be self-reliant and, you know, in control of myself and all of that, and it was counterintuitive. So it's taken a, a long time to understand that, and I'm still trying to. Um, the other thing is I told Bill, my, my new sponsor, that I wasn't really planning to stop drinking because it wasn't a problem. And he said, well, you know, if it's not your drug of choice, it'll probably take you back to your drug of choice. And I suggest really strongly that you don't drink for a period of time. Think of it as an experiment. And, um, you know, like, could you go six months without drinking? And I, I mean, I was already practically not drinking. And I said, okay. I'll tell you, the next time that I was at a taqueria and I saw the case of beer there, my mouth started watering like Pavlov's dogs. I mean, I was just like, I don't know, that was a little bit of a wake-up call, but it was still a while before I was comfortable calling myself an alcoholic, I mean, or, or thinking of myself as one. Hearing your stories and how, even though my pattern wasn't the same as yours, and maybe I drink didn't drink as much as some of you, or, you know have the DTs. I, there was enough in that I could recognize my alcoholism. I mean, I did have alcohol poisoning one time. I forgot that part in my drunk log. Anyway, um, so I worked with that sponsor for about four years and went through the steps and uh, that was a really a, a good process. I, I also found out about MA, Marijuana Anonymous, and I went to those meetings. But I Thank you. Ten minutes. So, I, um, and that was Marijuana Anonymous was a good place for me to identify with other potheads, and uh, it it was um, I made a lot of friends there, and it also helped my recovery a lot. But I have always felt like AA is where I hear the message of recovery the most clearly. Maybe because it's the original twelve step program. Or I think also just because there are so many people in AA and there are so many meetings, and I suggest to people to go to a lot of meetings and hear a lot of voices and a lot of different kinds of stories. And um, um, I, I just think that that's so, been so helpful for me in my recovery. Anyway, so I worked with Bill and went through the steps. And um, at one point, he was pushing me to look at some things that were challenging for me, and I was a little bit uncomfortable with it, and I didn't call him. I was like not really feeling real motivated to talk to my sponsor all of a sudden. And I didn't talk to him for a week, and then it was two weeks, and then it was two years. And I I mean, it, after a while, I thought, this isn't good. I need to have a sponsor. But I, I was ashamed of letting it go. And he's, he was never the kind who would call, chase after me. You know, I mean, he, he was like, this is for people who want it. You know, you need to be calling me. And um, and uh, finally, I, um, I don't have time to tell the story, but I got the willingness to call him back. And uh, we got, we re reconnected. And I am so glad that I did. We've been working together ever since. We worked through the steps a second time. I'm I'm overdue to work it another time. I mean, the the way I understand working the steps in a formal way with the sponsor uh, is 
it's learning a practice. This is a practice that it, that I'm supposed to be incorporating th this blueprint into my life like every day. This is how I'm supposed to be operating. And um, it, it's a coping mechanism that, that works. Alcohol and drugs were the coping mechanism that didn't work. And um, Jeff ended up getting cancer. He actually got cancer the first time about um, a month or two after I got sober, which was kind of wild. And uh, had it, it was cured with radiation. But then, you know, I don't know, probably about nine years later, he got it again. And it was in remission for a few years. Um, but then it wasn't. And that was about four years ago. It just got out of control. And the last four years have been pretty hard for me. Uh, watching him die, watching watching somebody that you love having, you know, cancer slowly take away so many things and uh, watching them suffer. Very hard. I'm so glad that I had this program, that I had my sponsor, that I had other people in recovery, and also that I could watch Jeff and how he dealt with it. He had a wonderful program uh, and um, he was able to look at the end of his life one day at a time and look and find the joy in um, every day, not, not spoil the day worrying about what was going to happen tomorrow. And that's kind of what my idea is of how uh, the best way that I can live my life. And it's not easy to do. Uh, I mean, one of the things I've, that I'm learning through my recovery is how my mind works. Uh, what I, the way I've learned to think from a child up through, you know, now, Negative thinking, looking for problems all the time, not be, not being able to be calm and in and, and comfortable in my own skin. It's a habit. It's it's all it's like an addiction almost. Like if if things are going well, I have to start thinking about like what's what's the next threat? What's the next thing that I can obsess about? I don't want to make it sound like my life is a wreck. This program has given me that awareness and the tools that I can uh, interrupt that that chain of thinking. But it's 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 still there, and I have to um, I have to deal with it. Uh, I you know I have a meditation practice. That helps. It's that's practice of letting go. I'm down to five minutes now. Um, you know, um, but it gets back to this higher power thing that was so confusing and threatening at the beginning of all of this. The idea of turning it over, letting go. It's it's not that my will doesn't count for anything. This program tells us. It talks about the proper application of our will, and I. So my recovery is trying to understand that. Where should I be putting my focus, and how how should I be trying to see myself in relationship to events and other people and things that are happening? I guess one of the things about the third step that was really confusing to me is like. How am I supposed to, how is God going to communicate with me? How am I going to know what God's will is? Am I going to see a burning bush over there that's going to talk to me? And, you know, it's just like, that's bullshit. That's a fairy tale. But I heard somebody in the room say, you want to know what God's will is? Look around. Look at what's happening. You know, there's not that much that's in my control. And, you know, if you want to call it God or higher power or whatever, I think it's really useful to just know where to draw the line between what what I can control or should can try to control and what I can't. And that's why we say the serenity prayer all the time. I mean, it's so um, 
have the sense that I'm getting down to the last few minutes here. There's still more work to do. There always will be. I'll be in these rooms, hopefully, for the rest of my life. And I won't have to... I know I don't have to go out and uh, use or, or drink again. If I do, I hope that I come back to these rooms. And uh, But while I'm here, I I just hope that I can get more out of this. Because being sober isn't enough for me. I really want the the peace of mind. That was the big surprise at my first meeting, that this is about more than just getting sober and and clean. Um, And I do think it's really important for us to to be clean and sober and not not use any drugs that doctors aren't prescribing for us because, um, you know, using anything like that is going to, you know, complicate my connection with the higher power. Um, I'm, I'm very happy with, with the results that I've got. Um, but it's really one day at a time. Uh, the, I have a friend who says that, um, putting time together, you know, uh, getting 16 years, time is not a tool of this program, but it does give me evidence of, of, um, how I'm being taken care of. And, um, you know, I think it's really important for me to, to understand that that was another one of the things that I heard uh, probably at that very first meeting, uh, was, um, you know, God is taking care of me or higher power is giving me what I need. Maybe it's not always giving me what I want, but it's giving me what I need. And I need to be aware of that. One of the other things I heard at my very first or one of my first meetings was that if, um, if, if nobody ever gets on your nerves at a meeting, it means you're not going to enough meetings. <laughs> so, yeah, okay. Some people start with a joke. I'm going to end with a joke. But it's, it's, it's really, I think that um, it's really important to, um, to just come here and listen to people's stories. And you might not hear what you, what you, um, you might not always hear what you want to or what you need to, but there's something to be learned from everybody. I hope that uh, what I've shared tonight uh, is useful to to you, and maybe even is something something that I said is something that you needed to hear today. I often go to a meeting and um, I'm like, "Wow, I just I heard something I really needed to hear," and I need a lot of reminders about how this works because I have a short memory. But if I work this one day at a time, I get pretty good results, and I'm happy to be here. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.